Conrad Philby considered himself a confirmed bachelor. It amused him to see the light of battle dawn in women's eyes, not that he was to be thought of as an object of desire. He preferred to believe that the challenge was one of gender. Women simply could not accept that any man could be self-sufficient and supportive. They thought that nature, having made the division of the sexes, a woman was essential for the completion of a man. Any man. Philby had known quite a few women rise to the challenge, married and single, mature professional ladies, academics. A lecturer in medieval French made strenuous efforts to resolve the conflict. He thought she might be inspired by her subject matter, which could be coarse and even lewd. It made him appreciate that totally unlettered child, Daisy Maybrick. He became aware of Daisy in the basement restaurant of the tower block where they both worked. She always sat at the same table, eating the same lunch of a sesame roll and two inches of vacuum-wrapped cheddar. That much he noted in passing, after he had passed her a dozen or more times. He realised her as an entity when she ceased to be in her usual place, noticeable by her absence. He looked for her the next day, and the next, supposed she might have left her job, wondered idly where she might have gone. Then, suddenly, she was back, her nose pink, paper tissues at the ready. He paused by her table, said, glad to see you're getting over it. She looked up, blinking rapidly, a habit of hers when startled. Over it? You're cold. He nodded kindly and moved on to his own table. Thereafter they exchanged glances, she in the shyest possible way. He gave her some general consideration while he ate his lunch. She was small, plumpish and quite comely in her person. Persona, however, she did not have. Her hair looked as if it had been trimmed round a basin. She wore, whatever the weather, a raincoat, twistily belted at the waist, oatmeal stockings and scuffed quarts. Whereas other women made too much of themselves, she made nothing. He found that, marginally at least, the more interesting. Of course, she was still a child, and there was no knowing how long, or what, it would take to make a woman of her. She seemed not to have friends or acquaintances. She kept her head down, fiddling with the plastic wrapper on her piece of cheese. She always had, or made, difficulty in getting it off. Philby used to watch while chewing his steak and resolving any points outstanding from the morning's business. He was heir apparent to the senior partnership of an old established firm of solicitors with offices on the prestigious third floor of the tower block. One day, provoked by her ineptitude, he rose up, went to her table and split the cheese wrapper with a stroke of his thumbnail. She thanked him, startled again and blinking. On her, fluttering eyelashes were in no way flirtatious. Next day, he joined her at her table. The whim to do so came over him as he was carrying his tray from the servery. He asked where she worked, and she said, Ranger Rooms. He said, The travel agents? She was, he gathered, a very junior employee. She did not make out travel documents or anything. Mr. Heatherston did that. She typed envelopes and made tea and went to the post office to buy stamps. Her parents were dead. She lived with an aunt in Hackney. Such was the unpromising encounter which he decided not to repeat. But he had reckoned without Mr. Heatherston. The next day her small nose was ruddier than a cherry, her eyelids puffy. She gazed up at him through a mist. Not another cold, he said. She shook her head. It was Mr. Heatherston, she said, weeping copiously over her sesame roll. Mr. Heatherston had made a pass. She appeared unaware of the significance of what had happened, knew only that she had not liked it. I don't know what he wants, she cried. She was not to remain long in ignorance of Mr. Heatherston's wants. He made the proposed sequence clear to her one afternoon. She fought him off. Her face bruised, her lip bitten, she fled down the stairs. Philby, waiting for the lift, moved to check her headlong rush. Beside herself, she beat on his chest with hard little fists, then relaxed into his arms. Holding her, he found, was a pleasant experience. When, sighing, she drew away, 
he felt bereft. The feeling persisted. Sensations he had hardly begun to have were crammed in those few moments while she was in his arms. He took himself to task, admitted that he was treading in Heatherstone's wake, tried to put her out of his mind. But when days passed and she did not return to her job, she was not just conspicuous by her absence. She was flagrantly missing from his life. He got her address from the new girl at Ranger Rome and went to Hackney. He found her with her aunt, a woman wearing a floral pinafore and curlers in her hair. Philby and Daisy were married in a registry office. She would have liked a white wedding with bridesmaids. Philby said it would be unsuitable at his age. She did not point out that it would be suitable at hers. She had so few clothes and no money. Concerned as to what she was going to wear for the ceremony, he gave her his credit card. Get yourself a new dress. A wedding dress? An outfit. You need a coat and shoes and things. Undies. Smiling, he kissed her. Go to a decent dress shop where they'll find something your style. She wouldn't let him see what she had bought. It was unlucky, she said, for the groom to see the bride's dress before they got to the altar. There'll be no altar, he said. She set her lips. She had full, rounded lips, but she compressed them into a straight line. It was an indication that she had a will of her own. Philby was never to forget his first sight of her on their wedding day. He was hit in the solar plexus. He stared, appalled. Her dress was not merely unsuitable, it was manifestly ill-advised, for her and for the occasion. It turned her into a clown, her small breasts moving recklessly in the low-cut bodice, her neck dwarfed by enormous puffed sleeves, her knees, still in oatmeal stockings, sturdy at the opening of the slit skirt. The colour of the dress was vintage claret. She ran to him, radiant. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it the most beautiful dress you've ever seen? He saw with dismay that she believed it. She could not see what the dress was doing to her. It could not dim her radiance. It burlesqued it. She cried, You do like it, don't you? You like my wedding dress? What could he say? He said, Of course. It was the sophistication of the garment which had attracted her. Sophistication was a quality she could never have. He felt a wave of pity, which was unwelcome. One should not pity one's bride on her wedding day. But she was young and unblemished, and he was able to excuse her, although she called him Connie, which he could not excuse. One youthful trait he found easy to forgive was her untidiness. It was endearing, exciting even, to come upon a discarded stocking shaped to her young leg, and her bra draped over the towel rail. Her absurd shower cap with sponge rubber flowers only slightly aggrieved him when he found it in the drawer with his clean shirts. He was, after all, twice her age, and prepared to allow the handicap of twenty years less of life and experience. Marrying late after being single so long, he felt in a position to appreciate the plus and minus of the two states. Asked, he would certainly have recommended the married state. He was not asked. It was obvious that they were happy together. For the first months of their marriage, they did not go about much. He hoped to educate her to a better dress sense. Although young people nowadays wear most extraordinary garments and combinations of garments, Philby had no intention of seeing his wife a neo-freak. She took his gentle tuition to heart. She loved him and longed to please. It was not for want of trying that she failed. It was simply her innate disposition to like the wrong clothes, to put on conflicting colours, misjudge the general effect. She even misjudged her own measurements. There came, as come it must, the occasion of the retirement party for Linwood, senior partner of Philby's firm, and the public announcement of Philby's accession to the partnership. Daisy was nervous. It would be her first encounter with Philby's business colleagues. Oh, Connie, what shall I wear? Don't call me that. He took her to Harrod's dress department and talked to a sales lady. When he had explained the situation, she looked consideringly at Daisy. 
I think something neutral, and we should avoid a fussy outline. She chose, with Philby's approval, a corn-coloured silk suit, tailored but softened by the addition of a fringe scarf to be lightly thrown over one shoulder. Like this, the saleslady said, demonstrating to Daisy, who had wound it schoolgirl fashion round her neck. It's not really a party dress, she said, setting her lips in that tight little line. You look very nice in it, he said, equally firmly. The Orchid Suite at Linwood's Club was the venue for the occasion. Ladies not normally being admitted to the club premises, the Orchid Suite had its own cloak and powder rooms. Philby had no sight of Daisy when she had taken off her outdoor coat until she appeared in the vestibule. It was a repeat of the moment months previously in the registry office. He experienced the same jolt in the same place where his heart ended and his stomach began, this time followed by a wave not of pity, but of anger. She was wearing the claret dress with the over-puffed sleeves and plunging neckline, the skirt gaping open to her stocking tops. People turned to stare. A woman laughed aloud. Daisy was also wearing her wedding day smile, shy, tender, blissful. Anger engulfed him. When she held out her hands, he did not take them. What the devil's this thing doing here? For it seemed to him that the dress was there by her invitation. He struck it with knotted fingers. Why are you wearing this? She shrank from him, blinked wide-eyed. Why aren't you wearing the dress I chose? I don't like it. I want to look my best for you. This is my wedding dress. You think I don't know that? Connie, you love my wedding dress. Love it. I can't stand the sight of it. My God! He knew his voice was carrying, but was unable to care. If you could see what a guy you look, people are laughing. Laughing? Looking round, she encountered the broad, effulgent grin of a young man. Philby cried, I can't stand the sight of you in that dress. She uttered a sound between a gasp and a sob. She was gone before Philby could bring himself to go after her. Those ridiculous sleeves burgeoned into wings as she ran. She ran into the street, straight into the path of a speeding taxi. Blinded by tears, someone said. Tears stood on her cheeks when they took her from under the wheels. Philby remarried six months later. Some people thought it was out of character. They would have said, and did say, that it should have taken him longer to get over the tragedy of Daisy's death. Philby himself was unsure of his feelings. He had believed himself confirmed, a confirmed sceptic, a confirmed newspaper reader, a confirmed wine drinker, but he was not, it seemed, a confirmed bachelor. The single state oppressed him. He needed another half. He married the lecturer in medieval French. She was tall and elegant, had impeccable taste in clothes, and wore them with style and flair. She was also much nearer Philby's age. She was not a Catholic, and they agreed to have a civil wedding. Linwood was invited to the ceremony and the master of her college. Philby was satisfied that it would be a very creditable occasion. As he stood chatting with Linwood outside the registry office, a woman cried, Oh, doesn't she look wonderful? Philby turned to see his second bride-to-be coming towards him in the claret dress with the big sleeves, the plunged neckline and slashed skirt. It looked like the self-same dress his first bride had worn. It couldn't be. He had burned that one. This, as worn by the lecturer in medieval French, was beautiful. <laughs>